Hello and welcome to our third instalment of our studies from uh, the book of Job in the Old Testament, a study brought to you by the British Bible School during the time whilst we're all in lockdown, which hopefully is useful to anyone who's able to tune in. So this week we're going to be looking at Job's troubles. The first week we had an introduction to suffering coming into the world and last time we looked a little bit deeper at the book itself. Now we start to look at the beginning of Job's troubles. Just a little recap, we did this at the end of the last study, but we do need to get to grips and understand Job's character as we're studying this. His character is analysed in four virtues, as we said, blameless or perfect, depending on the, the version that you're reading. He was upright, he feared God, and he turned away from evil. And we're told there is none like him on the earth. So we have to understand the character of Job. We have to know from the outset of the book the kind of person that he is. Otherwise, we might get the idea he's been a bad person or done something bad that has brought about his suffering. Without a shadow of doubt, hearing of his character and his relationship with God, we cannot say his suffering is due to his bad thoughts or actions. He was a man who was greatly blessed. This is one of the ways in which people regard those, especially of Old Testament times, the way in, thing, way in which things are counted and numbered as far as their possessions is concerned. And with a family of seven sons and three daughters, he would be regarded as someone who is blessed by God. But he also had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camel, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a large household. And again, in verse three of chapter one, we're told this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. He was the spiritual leader of his family. We uh, saw that his sons liked to have feasts, they liked to have parties, yet Job wanted to sanctify them, make sure that they were holy in the eyes of God by offering burnt sacrifices on their behalf. So in chapter one and verse six, we read now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. So in this whole section from verse 6 of chapter 1 through to verse 13 of chapter 2, after Job has been introduced to us and we're left in no doubt about the quality and goodness of the man, we then learn of the conversation between God and Satan concerning Job. Now the sons of God are mentioned. This is the heavenly court, the angels. In the first lesson, we noted that the invisible world was also created by and through Jesus. When we get to chapter 38 of Job and verse seven, the phrase is used again. The usage suggests that these were celestial beings. Now at an appointed time, they had to present themselves before God and give an account of their activities. And amongst them was Satan. Let's read now from verse 7 to verse 12. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he'll curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. There's a few things that we learn from these verses. First of all, it is, of course, that Satan is accountable to God. He had to represent himself before God. He was asked where he'd been and what he'd been doing. We'll see a repeat of this later as well. Satan is out to get us. He is out to destroy us. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, we're warned that he's like a, a roaring lion prowling round looking who he might devour. Anyone who has the approval of God is a target of Satan. We see it mentioned here 
and again in chapter 2 and verse 2 and as I said in 1st Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. In Revelation chapter 9 and verse 11 he is called Apollyon which means the one who exterminates or destroys. Related to this identification of Satan as the destroyer is his association with murder and death. He was a murderer from the beginning John 8 and verse 44 says and this is repeated in Hebrews 2 14 and 1st John chapter 3 verses 11 and 12. Satan is the accuser. That's what the word Satan means, accuser. Note also that the Greek diabolos means slanderer and relates to defamation, libel and misrepresentation. In Revelation he is called the accuser of our brothers in chapter 12 and verse 10. It is in that role that he operates in these early verses of Job. He makes the accusation that Job's faith is not genuine, that it's focused not in God himself, but in the physical health and prosperity with which God has blessed Job. He attacks the integrity of Job's faith and his relationship with God, saying that it is all a sham, covering up Job's materialism, that it is not God that Job's, Job loves, but God's gifts. The fact that Satan means adversary can operate on two levels as well. Level one, where Satan is God's adversary, God's enemy. This is a basic fact. And level two, Satan is therefore the adversary of everything that belongs to God and is approved by God. Anything that is precious to God is automatically the target for the opposition and attacks of this enemy. We can see this in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31, where God announced that everything was very good. Then in Genesis 3, 1 to 4, where certain Satan comes in to corrupt that perfection. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 17, we see where God affirms his pleasure in his son. And then in Matthew 4 and verse 4, Satan comes in to try and turn Jesus away from God's appointed path. Again, in Matthew 16 and verse 17, we see that Jesus receives another affirmation from his father. But in Matthew 16, verses 22 and 23, just a few verses later, Satan, through Peter's words, again seeks to turn Jesus away from the cross. The person on whom God's blessing rests, and it rests on all who believe in Jesus Christ, automatically has Satan as an enemy. They are automatically involved in this great cosmic opposition of Satan to God and all that is God's. Satan is a liar. He is described as a tempter and deceiver. We see this in the passages I've already mentioned in Genesis 3 and Matthew 4, John 8 and in 1 Corinthians. Here in Job, Satan even has the audacity to lie to God himself. All of this activity of Satan is directed against God and against his servant Job. It is also directed against us as believers in Jesus Christ, both individually and together as the church. Satan works in the same way today. We see evidence of this when individual believers may be plagued by doubts or by guilt, by self-condemnation, by a lack of assurance of salvation because we've tried to depend on ourselves and on God's work and we feel that we're not good enough and Satan's there telling us we're not. I said plagued by doubts. Doubts can actually lead to greater faith when we investigate further to dispel them. Guilt also needs to be felt so that we put the brakes on sin and temptation. But Satan can use those things to let the self-condemnation make us feel we hadn't ought to be saved or that God wouldn't want us. He is a liar. We see it when individual believers experience abnormal suffering. We all perhaps know people who have suffered one thing after another and we, we wonder about the size of their suffering or the duration of their suffering. And Satan will try and use that as well to turn us from God. 
We see evidence of Satan's work when individual believers suffer persecution because of their allegiance to Christ. That's a time when Satan might say there's an easy way out. Just stop what you're believing. What about when the church, the congregation or individual believers are deceived by false teaching? Where's that coming from? Is it overt or subtle? Satan will use both. We also see evidence of his lies when a congregation or individual believers believe the lies, for instance, about the origin of the world or the nature of the Bible. The New Testament warns us to expect it and to be prepared for it. Satan is opposed to all that is God's. He is consumed with hatred for and opposition to God. He so hates God that he wants to corrupt and destroy all that is precious to him. For someone to appear to love God as Job did is to Satan like a red rag to a bull. He so hates God that he cannot bring himself to believe that anyone could possibly love God with a pure love. He so hates God that he hates to see anyone obeying and submitting to God and giving glory to him. He so hates God that he hates to see the kingdom of God advancing and spreading throughout the world. He so hates God and the thought of anyone loving God that he opposes anything that will undo the effects of sin and reconcile any person to God. Notice in verses 7 and 8 where the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. This reminds us, as I've already mentioned, of 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Satan is pacing around, going to and fro on the earth. And what's he doing? Like a lion, he's looking for who he might devour. On this occasion, when Satan came before the Lord, God asked him whether he had considered his faithful servant Job. Satan responded with an attack on Job's character, that his fear of God was only because God blessed him. Satan then said that Job would curse God if everything he had was taken away. In response, God put all that Job had in Satan's power, with the exception of Job himself. Note the flow of conversation that takes place from verses 8 to 12. First, God asks, have you considered Job? Second, Satan makes the suggestion that God should afflict Job and see if he really loves him. Thirdly, God gives permission for Satan to go ahead and do it. And then fourth, God sets a limit as to what Satan can do. This is a perspective which we need to constantly keep in mind. Satan is not autonomous. Satan is not on the same level of authority as God. He wants to be. He acts as though he is, but he's not. He is a created being who is in a state of constant rebellion against his creator, constantly trying to undermine and usurp his authority. But he is, and he knows he is, actually under the authority of God. He cannot touch Job or Job's possessions and family unless God allows it. He can only go as far as God permits him to. But, but why pick on Job? Well, think about this and the way things used to be done in battles. Think about Goliath, the best fighter of the Philistines. If the Israelites can send their best fighter, the battle can be decided between the two of them. Goliath versus David. Whoever wins, that nation wins. Satan versus Job. Winner takes all. God sent the best that he'd got. If Job wins, we can all win. We know we can win. And Satan can forever be the loser. In verses 13 to 19, we read the following words. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were ploughing and the donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, 
the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While I was yet speaking, they came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. In one day, just one day, Job was deprived of all his possessions. It seems that it was systematic. There was a plan. Satan didn't just go about things haphazardly. He planned what he was going to do. By planning it, he made it increasingly painful. The order in which Job valued his possessions was the order in which they were taken away. The climax, of course, being the loss of his children. And it was sudden. One messenger followed another to tell of the bad news. It was all completed in one day. As one finished speaking, the next messenger came in with the next piece of bad news. It was complete. Satan had said, touch all that he has. And God replied, all that he has is in your hand. So Satan made full use of this permission. Even the exceptions made his suffering complete. You see, Satan spared one servant each time in order that they could each bring the awful news to Job of what had happened. Even Job's wife was spared. And later on we'll see how Satan also could use her. Notice that there are different causes at work. He made use of the Sabaeans, the Chaldeans, there was lightning and the storm. Satan was a cause, and even God, according to his own good pleasure, as Job himself said. Notice Satan hides behind other means. He wants Job to think that God is angry with him. This is obviously coming from God, he can't see Satan. Job's friends emphasised that very thing when they came along. They will see what Satan wants Job to think. And what was Job's response in verses 20 to 22? He arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. He tore his robe, he shaved his head. This showed that he was deeply grieved. This wasn't something he could just brush away. There was deep grieving. He speaks of coming into the world without possessions. Why should he now complain that those things have been taken away? He never had them in the first place. When he dies, he will leave the world the way he came in, without possessions. Whatever he has between life and death belongs to God anyway. And what's left for this God-fearing man to do? He praised God, who is the owner of everything and has the right to do what he wants with what is his. So what's the score at the end of round one? Job's faith was genuine. We see that he did not serve God for what he could get out of serving him. And even in his poverty, he praised God for who he was. We see that Satan's lies were exposed. His lies about Job were exposed. Job really did serve God because of his faith in him and his love for him. His lies about God that he got people to uh, love him through things that he does for them. And he was thoroughly defeated. Satan was defeated and Job's faith was still intact.
Following this, in verse the first six verses of chapter 2, we read, Again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, who fears God and turns away from evil? He still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man has he will give his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. So Satan here is reminded of his defeat. God tells him, Job still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. God gives the same testimony about Job as he did before. But Satan does not admit defeat. He is silent regarding what has happened. And then he goes on to belittle Job's first trial by introducing the second. Oh, that was nothing because these things didn't mean anything to him. Skin for skin. A man's life is worth more than his possessions. God only won, he said, because Job himself was spared. Satan admits God's sovereignty. But in proposing to God to now touch Job's bone and flesh, he's actually admitting that God is sovereign. You touch his bone and flesh. He offers the same blasphemy as the result. Now Job will turn from God if you touch his own body. So Satan leaves with a new permission. Let's read on from verse 7 of chapter 2. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. So the second test comes along. And with such power that he's given, Satan strikes Job with painful boils over his entire body. Compare what we read in chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, to chapter 7 and verse 5, where he says, My flesh is clothed with worms and dirt. My skin hardens, then breaks out afresh. And also in chapter 30 and verse 30, where he says, My skin turns black and falls from me and my bones burn with heat. These are not simple boils like we would experience. This is a constant pain, an awful pain, such that even Job's wife lost what faith she might have had and told him to curse God and die. Job, however, refuses to sin with his lips. He will not curse God. So consider again, why? Job. Why consider Job? God is not afraid to have his work in Job put to the test. Here is someone who will not fail him. But when called up to make a stand, will make the stand. Satan is challenging the righteousness of God. What is your righteousness if you're going to clothe someone with your righteousness and they desert you? God stakes his righteousness and integrity on the righteousness and integrity of Job. He is the best that God has got. If Satan can win here, if he can beat the best that God has got, he can beat anybody else. There is one restriction. Do not kill Job. He is still limited. And it makes me wonder about myself being clothed with God's righteousness. Do I really make the stand that's needed to prove that God is righteous? So all at once, Job suffered what is common 
to all humanity. He went through financial and economic suffering. He lost everything he had. There was a loss of security from those things. There was a loss of long term workers and associates, many of whom would have been trusted and loved. He suffered bereavement and experienced grief. There was physical suffering and pain. He was also socially ostracised. He was excluded from his society and cut off. From chapter 2 and verse 8, we read about that. And his relationship suffered as well, not only with his wife, but with his so called friends initially and throughout their debates. There was obviously disappointment, unfulfilled expectations. Did he ever expect anything like this would happen? There was misunderstanding. He was being accused of things that weren't true. False accusation followed false accusation about the kind of things he must be involved in in order to be suffering like this now. Satan was at work on Job. And we need to be aware that Satan will also get to work on us as well. We need to be ready and we need to understand that any of these things, no matter how well life is going, could come upon us. But the important thing is that we remain faithful to God. Satan is already defeated. Don't let him win any battles with you.